Coming up now on Animal Outtakes, it's all about elephants. We get up close to these intelligent, emotional creatures. From bathing to pedicures, I get the chance of a lifetime to connect with these endearing animals. Then we get a good look at this little guy affectionately named Booger. All kidding aside, there's a lot to learn about this indicator species. Plus, Doc takes us to one of the most popular shipwreck dives in the Keys. This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtake. It is said that elephants are walking bodies of emotions. They can show joy and happiness and they grieve the loss of loved ones. These intelligent animals are often personified throughout history as wisdom, strength, and even good luck. They have an amazing memory and play an important role in the circle of life. We visited the Mayaka Elephant Ranch to see how connecting with these creatures in person makes all the difference. We are at Mayaka Elephant Ranch. We are a conservation center for elephants. Uh, we specialize in educating the public and also raising money for conservation efforts. We do have three elephants. Uh, one is an African elephant and two are Asian elephants. My parents actually had elephants 10 years before I was born, uh, so really kind of born into it. Uh, they had Lou since she was a year and a half old. Uh, her name's Lou. I was born 10 years later. My name's Lou. Uh, so both kind of after my grandfather, so technically I wasn't named after the elephant. Can you bring her? Yeah, that's good. So just growing up with the elephants, always being around elephants, uh, created a big passion for me. Uh, just their size, their intelligence, just how majestic they are. They're just amazing animals. Come on, Carol, move up. Carol, come on. Being an elephant caregiver, you do have to build a relationship. You have to spend a lot of time. You also have to they have to know you're not going to hurt them in any way. You're going to provide them food, shelter, security. Uh, you build, really start building a relationship with that animal. Uh, so I get up at about 6 o'clock in the morning, get here. Uh, we first feed them their breakfast. Uh, they love their breakfast. It's about 15 pounds of grain, like a horse grain. We put a lot of vegetables, a uh, special vitamin supplement in there for them, omega-3, salt, different minerals. After that, we put them outside. We clean their stalls. Uh, then we go into the bath. So Lou, it's bath time. <laughs> it is bath time. <laughs> what are you doing here and why is this so important for the elephants? All right, so first thing we're doing, we're getting her nice and wet. Uh, so if you look at the water, it's actually just absorbed by that skin. Mm -hmm. uh, keeps them from getting over dry, really moisturizes their skin. Uh, really important for an elephant to get water on their whole body every day. Now, do they like it? An elephant, anything involving water, they love. <laughs> I notice she's getting her trunk wrapped around there like she's just so relaxed and oh. just letting it all happen. Lou loves her bath, but sometimes she starts purring, so we have to listen to that. <laughs> How old is she? Lou's 37 years old. Uh, she's an African elephant. Now, 37 years old. Young, middle-aged, old? Uh, she's about in her prime. Uh -huh. uh, so really for an African elephant, anywhere from 50 up is starting to get old. Uh, the Asian elephant, it lives a little longer. Okay. So you're gonna, come, you're gonna come right here. Okay. So you grab this, mm -hmm. and you're gonna squeeze that trigger all the way down, and uh -huh. apply some soap. Look it over, look it over. Hey, baby. So what we're doing right now, we're applying soap. Uh, our soap is called Safari Wash. It's made in Springfield, Missouri. Oh, she loves it. It's made just for elephants, hippos, and rhinos. So it's non-toxic, very good for their dry skin. Uh, let's get behind her ear yeah, here. Yeah, let's do that. She's purring. Yeah, she's purring. She's loving that. All back there. Oh, I'd like somebody to do this too. Don't worry, honey. And you can go behind the outside of her ear here. 
For the elephant, uh, really just the Africans purr, and maybe one out of eight Africans can do that purr. The Asian elephants really can't do it, uh, just a different type of tongue. When she purrs, she's really relaxed, comfortable, enjoying her bath. So it's a really content noise. I'd be content too. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. What is amazing though is as fast as we put this on, it is absorbed. Yeah, and that really shows you how important the water is for the skin. Don't forget the top of the back oh, there. Oh yeah, well, you know, she's if a little- If you notice on the top of her back, uh, there's a lot more callus. Yeah. So really for the African elephant, when the sun exposure hits their back, they need that extra layer of callus to protect them. She's a little- sunburn? Uh, the African really can't get sunburned because they have so much callus. Uh, the Asian elephant does have a lot thinner skin, so they can get a little sunburned. Uh, so that's why they love to throw the mud, the dirt, the hay, water on their backs to really protect them. All right, thank you. I think what is amazing is when you hear this purring and you realize that she's truly, truly relaxed. We're doing the work, but she's loving it. Um, this is an experience that I would hope everybody would have because <laughs> this, is, this is an emotional experience for me. I just love these animals. Tell us a little bit about what you do here. We are a nonprofit conservation and education center. So we really do have our key beliefs about education, conservation, and experience. The experience is what's going to lead to a lasting conservation effort. So from tusk to tail, we strive to educate our guests on elephant conservation while providing a memorable once-in-a-lifetime experience. I asked you as we were taking a wonderful tour of the facility, are you really a sanctuary? And you said, no, there is a distinct difference between a sanctuary and what it is that you do, and that is? So we're a conservation and education center. So we really do take a hands-on approach. So people actually help us with basic caretaking. So whether you're helping us prepare their breakfast and feed them, or washing them, some very basic maintenance that needs to be done every day. It really builds a lasting bond with the elephants and what it takes to care for them and have lasting conservation efforts. Your contribution to this right here, mm -hmm. what is it? So we're so excited about being a nonprofit so that we can really give back, not just to global elephant conservation, but our community here in the Sarasota Bradenton area. Uh, we've reached out to outreach groups, we have them coming out free of charge so they can really get the education aspect of what these elephants have to offer. So we have local nonprofits like Loveland Center, The Haven, and many others coming out, as well as we've had 911 dispatchers and police forces from Sarasota County. So we really want to continue that education and we do have opportunities for more. Um, on our website, you can go to our outreach tab and other nonprofits and deserving groups can apply to come out free of charge to really experience the elephants. I have always said, those of us who deal with animals, as you do and I do, that if you look into their eyes, you see their soul. Absolutely. And I saw beautiful, three beautiful souls here today. And as we were working with them and watching them get bathed, which they love, by the way, and a very interesting thing, Lou purrs. Absolutely. <laughs> when she is comfortable and enjoying that wash, she just purrs. And at the end, when you were touching her, I could see her drifting off to do a sleep, just having that comfort of you petting her and giving her that love. Right. So do they know, do they know people such as yourself, myself, others, that really have this innate warmth with animals, do they recognize it? Absolutely, they are such intelligent creatures. They notice everyone's personality and they just enjoy the interaction and they enjoy you coming out. And you could hear her while you were bathing her. <laughs> yeah. She was just purring away, yeah. just enjoying that scrub and getting that spa treatment, which is a true treat. And she enjoys that part of her day. So they enjoy the interaction that they get Absolutely. With, with the humans. Yes, it stimulates their brain. They're such intelligent creatures. You can tell the new smells, the new sights. They really enjoy that interaction. And like I said, it's basic caretaking, really learning what it takes to take care of an elephant and the needs they have in the wild. So we're gonna leave here today, reluctantly, <laughs> but we will leave. If I was to come back, say, in a month, and I would bathe Lou again, would she remember? Elephants have an amazing scent of smell. So they can actually smell miles, miles away in Africa, they can smell water. 
So they can also smell that with humans. So if they have a connection with someone, really like someone, they could recognize them out of a crowd a year away. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> So the message that you want to leave our viewers and all of us is that we need to take care of these animals. They might not be here in the very near future. And your contribution is. We are so excited about our partnership with the International Elephant Foundation to help, help elephants around the world. People coming out, they're contributing to that. And we hope that when you come out and have that experience, you have a place in your heart for elephants and you can help the future generations protect them. For more information, you can log on to their website, mayakaelephantranch.org. Coming up next, one of the most popular shipwreck dives in the Keys. And we head to Moat Marine Aquarium to get a closer look at Booger, a cute little guy with an important message. We'll be right back. These last few months have been challenging for everyone, especially me. I've walked many, many miles. I learned new tricks. I lost my afternoon nap time. I've stayed up many nights watching movie after movie after movie. I'm suffering from cabin fever. I'm in need of a renewed spirit. Dante's Den is the perfect boarding solution for your dog whether it's an overnight, short, or extended stay. Dante's offers the convenience, amenities, and overall luxury your pet is seeking. Spacious, air-conditioned dens have private patios, overlooking scenic pool and lakeside views, a sparkling pool with fountains to play in, surrounded by chase loungers and a staff that will cater to their every wish. To make a boarding reservation for your pup, call us at 941-219 3730. In this week's Diving with Doc segment, we take you to the waters just off of Key Largo, Florida. The remains of the Benwood Merchant Marine Freighter are scattered over a wide area at depths between 25 and 45 feet, making it the perfect place for scuba divers to explore. Let's take a look. Welcome back to Diving with Doc. I'm a Patty Master Scuba Diver Trainer, and today we're going back to Key Largo to dive the SS Benwood wreck. Come on and join us. So the SS Benwood it has a long history. So in 1942, as you know, we were right in the middle of World War II. Benwood was moving phosphate from Tampa to Norfolk. Because of German U-boat activity, they decided it was best to go blackout conditions. So the ship ran with no lights. They were using the lights off the shore to try to stay within three miles of the coastline. Well, it didn't work out so well, they hit the Tuttle. The Tuttle was another ship, and the Benwood sank right off French Reef. They cleaned up within a couple years after that, by 1950, they had cleaned the ship up, pulled everything out, now it's a natural artificial reef. Good news for divers is, 51 feet of water, it is an awesome dive to do, okay? Year round, clarity is perfect. Again, the only times that we stop diving in that area is during hurricanes. But the Benwood, after every hurricane, has opened up shown us a little bit more of the superstructure, of the actual structure itself. You can swim, dive, you can dive along the ribs, you can make out the steel structure the whole way. You're gonna start on top about 18 feet, we're gonna get all the way down to 52 feet down at the bottom of it, okay? So take your time, swim around. Again, there's lots of holes um, from corrosion. Do not put your hands in anything. Be safe while we're out here. I've, I've watched people left and right see if they can find something. Remember, this is a protected site. So if you do find something, you have to leave it there. Do not take home anything from the wreck. Now, sea life wise, again, we're looking at a lot of parrotfish here. We swim around with the parrotfish. They follow us. We swim around with the angelfish. Though, again, the Benwood is just very similar to the Copenhagen. There's gonna be some lionfish. Be careful. 
all right? So if you see lionfish, again, go up, talk to your dive master up on the boat, let them know there's a lionfish down below, and then they'll send their guys down with a zoo cage, and they'll catch the lionfish. You do not try to do that on your own. When you're out and about, make sure you spread out a little bit, because after the hurricanes, the bendwood has twisted and has pulled apart some. So you're talking about 250 yards within a big giant area where you can see parts of the bendwood wreck. So make sure you dive the entire area, all right? Once we get down to the 52 foot area and you're coming around the aft part of the ship, there's actually some of the parts have broken apart and they're leaning against the ground, the bottom of the shore, and they're leaning against the ship. So it gives you a nice little swim area so you can swim through, but make sure your gear is all tied up. You don't want to get caught on anything. So make sure you lock everything down. Make sure you want pass it one at a time through these little areas. It's on the right hand side and you guys will have a blast doing it. Today, the Benwood is a protected resource under the Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary. Coming up next, we talk nutrition for your dogs with Dr. Greg Greiner. And a little later, this terrapin just might steal your heart. Stay with us. I think something happened to my family. I'm scared and lonely. What's gonna happen to me now? Don't worry, Sonny. Our loving staff at Dante's Den will take care of all your pet needs for the rest of your life. A warm bed, toys, great food, walking, and swimming is all at your paw tips. And if you get sick, there is even a hospital and medical staff to help you get well. Dante's Den, continuing the love. This is Booger. Booger is a six-year-old Eastern Diamondback Terrapin. A Terrapin is an interesting little creature. It's a reptile, actually, and it's sort of between a tortoise and a turtle. A tortoise tends to live on the land, and a turtle, for the most part, tends to live in the water. The Terrapin kind of lives actually in between, so it spends about half of its time in the water and half of its time on land. The interesting thing about this little creature is that it lives in brackish water. So brackish water means that it's partly salty and partly fresh. And where we find these guys is kind of unique too, actually. So they're found all through Florida, all the way up the East Coast towards Massachusetts and around the Gulf Coast, all the way down to Texas. And they're found in any sort of like shallow bay or estuary and area. Turtles are actually really important in our ecosystem. They're, they're what scientists call an indicator species. So an indicator species is something that gives scientists an overall idea about the health of the ecosystem. So if we find these little turtles, we can kind of get an idea for how healthy the ecosystem is as a whole. They eat all sorts of things. They eat an omnivorous diet. So they tend to like clams, mussels, sometimes shrimp, 
algae, any kind of plant they can find in a submerged kind of aquatic area. And they can live anywhere from 25 to 40 years out in their environment. So they're pretty long lived little creatures. They are beautiful. They have really noticeable skin and actually scoots on the top of what's called their carapace or their shell. So in nature, a lot of times we find what's called disruptive coloration. And that's a common method that animals will use to protect themselves against predators. So that pretty skin can act as almost like a camouflage of sorts to confuse any kind of animal that would come along and want to eat little booger here. The interesting thing about this little fella is that he's actually what we call an ectotherm. And an ectotherm is basically what we call a cold-blooded creature. So he has to spend some time out in the sun warming himself up uh, when it does get cold. So it might be common to find them on rocks or on riverbanks or on coastal sandy dunes on days like today where it's pretty chilly here in Florida. Humans have a really interesting history with terrapins. They were harvested pretty extensively in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, they were considered a delicacy on a lot of menus. The word terrapin comes from an indigenous word uh, that was from the Algonquin natives that means tasty little turtle. And so it kind of gives you a little bit of an indication as to what their history was with human interaction. Uh, of course, now they're not harvested anymore for, um, for their, you know, their tasty, tastiness, if you will. But thankfully now there are protections in place to protect these little fellas and ladies, and um, they are still listed as vulnerable to extinction, but there's a lot of protection in place to protect them, thankfully. We'll be right back. There are so many foods to choose from, uh, and of course, each one is the best. So where do we start and how do we choose it? Well, it's very frustrating because every diet has specific reasons why they are the best food for your pet and every other diet is bad. And uh, it has been my experience that probably 98% of the foods on the market are good for 90% of the, my patients. And there are kind of three levels of food. Uh, there are the store brands and generics, which are the lowest quality level. And uh, I'll occasionally get a dog that does great on those foods. Uh, mostly they don't, uh, but it depends on their metabolic needs, uh, their activity level, uh, that type of thing. Uh, I generally recommend for the average house pet to stick with the national brands. Uh, they do most of the feeding trials. You can have the best looking food in the world on paper, but until you've actually taken that food and fed it to dogs and watched them grow and develop, you really don't know how good the quality of your food is. And then there are the premium brands. Uh, kind of get what you pay for uh, in terms of protein. Uh, the premium diets are much higher in protein uh, you would think that that's just great for the average dog, uh, but it's like us eating steak every day for dinner. Uh, if you're a real active working dog, maybe that's what you need, uh, but the average dog does not, and they just tend to get fat on it. So uh, kind of watch, uh, we like to watch their weight. Everybody gets a body score every time they come in in our practice. We check their weight, 
And uh, it's a one to nine scale, five is ideal, nine is you're more morbidly obese, one is like you're dying of cancer. And uh, I would like to see it about a five when you're young, maybe a six when you're middle aged. Uh, you need a little bit of uh, uh, fat on your body if you get sick as you get older. That's my story, I'm gonna stick with it. And uh, but yeah, uh, we evaluate every dog every time they come in. If they look good, their stools are good, um, we're fine with what they're eating. Uh, but if we find some changes, if they're thin, if they're fat, uh, we'll recommend changes in diet. We also have a whole list now of prescription diets that are made for specific illnesses. And uh, if you have one of those, obviously we'll put you on that. Uh, but one of the things I would like to comment on, uh, and we're getting a lot more questions about it now, are the raw meat diets. God gave us fire for a reason, and that is to cook our food. Uh, it's one of the things that enabled civilization to occur is when man started cooking their food. It actually releases nutrients, and so they had to spend much less time hunting and gathering uh, and more time uh, concentrating on inventing things. So the same thing holds for dogs. Uh, everybody talks about the enzymes that are in raw meat. Well, as soon as those enzymes hit stomach acid, they're pretty much neutralized, and I don't believe they have much benefit at all. And I really am concerned about handling raw meat, uh, particularly most people make it in their kitchen, and you're going to make your own dinner in that area. And if any bacteria, particularly salmonella, are left behind, you can very easily get those. So uh, I'm not a proponent of raw meat diets at all. You have a number of people who are buying into this, uh, and they're saying, well, the dogs live longer because they're eating uh, raw food. Is that a fallacy? There's no evidence of that at all. So and, we uh, should really stick to uh, the kibble, and sometimes you can have wet food. But uh, on the whole, your recommendation is let's stick to what we know has been working. For sure. And uh, table foods, I am a, actually a big advocate of adding some table food uh, to dog food, uh, just as an occasional treat. Because as they get older, uh, one of the big diseases we see is kidney disease. And uh, we like to add carbohydrates and fats to their diet. If they've never had them before in their life, they may not tolerate them very well and just may not eat them. Uh, so I do recommend as an occasional treat, never from the table, otherwise they start begging all the time. Uh, but uh, a little bit of human food is not a bad thing. We hope you had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. We'll be back here again next week with some new animals and some wild adventures. Until then, thanks for watching. <laughs> Could you guys hear Lola? Through oh, that? yeah. <laughs> Let, hold on. Yeah. This is Lola. <laughs> well, whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. She's gorgeous. <laughs> Lola's getting into the bedroom right now. All kidding aside, there's a lot to learn about this indicator space Indicator. Wow, I sounded good.